There are all sorts of contentious issues relating to Brexit, from the status of Northern Ireland, which shares a demilitarized border with no checkpoints or border crossings, with the Republic of Ireland, which of course has remained in the EU, and also whether Britain would have free access to the common market despite having left and not being subject to EU regulations. There are, however, some major unresolved imperial issues that you might be unaware of. One of the issues that Britain and EU officials are facing relates to Gibraltar, a rock at the narrowest point of the Mediterranean coast. It's a British crown colony, and now that Britain has left the EU, Spain wants joint sovereignty at the very least, if not absolute possession outright. But to get to the point where Britain was able to acquire this rock at all, we need to go back to the late 16th century. Remember how I discussed the national security imperatives that were driving British expansion in Scotland and Ireland? They were fundamentally based around the fear of Spain, which in 1600 was the greatest power in Western Europe. Spanish fleets dominated the world's oceans. Spain had conquered vast swaths of territories in North and South America, and the Spanish crown owned massive gold and silver mines in the Americas, from Mexico to Peru. The precious metals they collected helped fuel the armies that led their counter-reformation efforts in Europe. The money that the Spanish gave the Irish and Highland clans ultimately came from the Americas, and for much of the 16th century, Protestant Europe lived in a simultaneous state of fear and fascination with Spanish power, and the lands to the west seemed to offer untold riches for any state that could actually acquire them. The English got into this act rather late. In 1498, Henry VII commissioned an Italian sailor named John Cabot to find a place that Henry called the Island of Brazil. Cabot sailed to the eastern shore of Canada and returned with news that he had come across a newfound land with abundant fisheries. Fishing fleets from Bristol and other places in England certainly sail out to exploit this, but then English colonization stalled. Nobody found permanent towns or forts in Newfoundland, and the English in the early 16th century don't really have the resources to establish other colonies along the eastern seaboard of North America, which at any rate, most Europeans don't believe possesses any of the fabulous gold and silver treasuries that exist to the south. This is the principal reason why Spain doesn't bother with it. The Spaniards establish a fort at St. Augustine in Florida to protect the treasure fleet sailing from the Caribbean, but they don't show much interest anywhere else. And for English policymakers, especially once Spain continually backs Catholic threats to the realm, wouldn't it be a lot cheaper simply to steal Spanish gold rather than set out to find it yourself? Into this fray emerged several legendary English sea dogs, John Hawkins, Sir Francis Drake, and Sir Walter Raleigh. They fitted their own ships and acted as privateers, receiving letters of marque from the English government that enabled them to attack Spanish shipping along the trade routes between Europe and the New World. A letter of marque basically meant that these men could not be held accountable in an English court for their actions. If they were captured by the Spanish, then they were on their own and could be tried as pirates. They often had convoluted wording, these letters of marque. Usually, they included a license to trade with Spanish colonies and a clause that permitted them to quote-unquote defend themselves with cannon on board, which meant that in peacetime, the English government could easily say that he disapproved of their actions and hadn't intended them to raid at all. Privateering is risky business, though. English captains have to launch their raids out of England since there aren't any safe ports abroad to rest and resupply. They need locations closer to the Spanish colonies they raid, and in 1585, Sir Walter Raleigh sent an expedition to a place that he called Roanoke, which was somewhere along the North Carolina coast. This was designed to be a base from which to attack the Spanish, but matters almost immediately go awry. The English didn't come prepared, thinking that they could survive the winter by taking food from the nearby indigenous peoples. Raleigh resupplied the colony in 1587, which at that point had 110 people, including women and one child that had just been born, named Virginia Dare. Unfortunately, an impending war with Spain, the conflict that culminated in the Sp famous Spanish Armada, intervened, and the English weren't able to return for another three years. 
When they did return in 1590, they found an empty settlement with no clues to the colonists' whereabouts except the line Croatone carved into a tree. This was the name of a nearby indigenous people, and maybe the colonists headed there, but nobody really knows. Full-scale colonization efforts would have to wait until the war with Spain concluded, which happens in 1604. Attention shifted from bases to attack the Spanish, though this remained an ever-present goal, to finding gold or perhaps a waterway to the Pacific Ocean. As I've already mentioned, most Europeans didn't believe that North Americans had much to offer in terms of precious metals, but in the late 16th century, a new legend appeared in the popular press. This concerned a place called El Dorado, which was so fabulously rich that the streets and fountains were paved with gold, people wore gold, and the buildings were made out of gold. If this sounds ridiculous, remember that in the past 100 years, Europeans had just found two entire new continents, and the states that they had quote-unquote discovered there, like the Aztecs and the Incas, were in fact fabulously wealthy. The legend of El Dorado appears to have originated as a decoy, with indigenous societies telling the Spanish that El Dorado existed, but was not here where they were located, but was far away, hoping the Spanish would simply believe in search of that elusive goal. Hoping to find this, or at least a waterway to the Pacific, or even just a mine or two of gold, a group of well-connected London merchants and politicians formed the Virginia Company, which they named after Queen Elizabeth, the Virgin Queen. In 1607, they located a site north of the failed Roanoke settlement, one they hoped would be a more permanent base than the other. Things, however, went wrong rather quickly, and to appreciate this, we need to look at the social composition of the settlers. Of the 68 arrivals whose names survive, 37 were gentlemen, meaning that they earned enough money from their lands through rent that they didn't need to work for a living. These colonists were driven mostly by excitement and a sense of adventure. They included the son of the Archbishop of York, several former members of Parliament who were bored with life in the capital, the son of Queen Elizabeth I's secretary, the son of James the First Chancellor, the brother-in-law to the Master of Rolls, effectively Britain's Attorney General, the brother of the Earl of Northumberland, and four sons of Thomas West, the Baron de la War, and one of the richest people in England. These men wanted an adventure, but why would they decide to go all the way to Virginia? There are a couple reasons for this. First, none of them expected to be there very long. The idea was to get rich quick, find gold, maybe set up an expedition to attack the Spanish, and then return home to England with the spoils. Secondly, you might have noticed that in describing these individuals, I referred to their status as brother of the Earl of Northumberland, brother-in-law to the Master of Rolls, etc., and not the actual Master of Rolls. When I mentioned that four sons of the Baron de la War went to Virginia, it's important to keep in mind that none of those sons were the eldest son, who was a man named Thomas West, who did not go to Virginia, and succeeded his father as the next baron. So these were men who had grown up with immense privilege, but who didn't really have a place in the world going forward. Under the system of primogeniture, which meant that the eldest son always received the full title to the land, second sons were not going to inherit anything. They had to make their own way, this would usually include careers in the church or in the military, but one way that opened up to make a life for yourself included heading out to Virginia. Going forward, this would be a recurrent feature of empire. Second sons go to India, Australia, and so on. The reason why the background of these settlers is so important is that it helps us understand the progress of the colony itself. These men, having grown up as elites, didn't have a clue about how to farm. They knew literally nothing about how to plant crops, when to harvest them, when to plant, etc. Back home, this was something that other people did. And since the Virginia colony was just a stepping stone to finding gold and attacking the Spanish, most thought that they didn't need to find out how to farm or anything of the sort. The non-gentlemen who came to Jamestown, which were fewer than half, 
also didn't include any farmers. They were usually soldiers of fortune, merchants, and laborers from the cities. The company's plan for getting through the winter was just to take food from the nearby Indians. Needless to say, this wasn't very much of a plan, and Jamestown colonists started dying like flies. Many starved, they roamed the countryside in search of food, some traded or did steal from the local Powhatan. Some ran off and joined the Indians, some ate bark from the trees and subsisted on grass, and there were rumors that some committed cannibalism, at least one colonist was actually executed for it. What made matters worse was the fact that once the settlers got there and realized that they weren't going to have enough food, many of the quote-unquote gentlemen refused to work. They considered it beneath them to work in the fields or plant crops, which in this case was through trial and error, and would literally sit around and play bowls all day, no matter how hungry they actually were. Moreover, the colonists were not alone in the Tidewater Swamp, as we have seen. The collection of peoples in the region are usually referred to as the Powhatan, after their paramount chief, who had spent much of the late 16th century accumulating an empire of vassals in the Tidewater region. The Powhatan offer food to the English, but also make clear that they expect the English to be one of the many subject peoples who pay tribute. This was anathema to the English colonists, who claimed the ground for the King of England, and who once were powerful enough would fight two wars in 1622 and in 1644 that would eventually result in the Powhatan's destruction. This is a bit in the future, though. With starvation facing them immediately in 1607-1608, the colonists opt for a radical solution. They appoint John Smith, a widely renowned soldier of fortune who had accompanied the voyage, to be their governor, and he possessed almost dictatorial powers from the outset. This is the same John Smith of Pocahontas fame, though his interaction with Pocahontas was nothing like the Disney movie. The ritual where Pocahontas saved Smith from execution does seem to have happened, though what Smith saw as a selfless gesture of mercy was likely a highly choreographed ceremony, one in which Powell hadn't accepted Smith and the English as his vassals, and whose continued existence, represented by Pocahontas saving him at the last minute, was dependent on the chief's mercy. There was certainly no romance, of course, between John Smith and Pocahontas. After all, she was 12 years old during the, their encounter. John Smith, after being appointed governor, instituted a draconian food distribution policy, and in an appointed rejoinder to those gentlemen who didn't want to farm, he issued an order saying that those who don't work will not eat. The Powhatan do begin teaching the English how to plant and what to plant in the Virginia soil, and over time the starvation threat decreases. Fortunately, however, the colonists don't seem to get anywhere in their efforts to find gold, the very reason for the colony to begin with. When times are tough, this prompts calls to abandon the colony, and at one point all of the settlers actually pack up and leave, but when they're on a ship in the James River heading out to sea, they run into the yearly resupply ship from England that the company sends, leading to some awkward conversations and a decision to go back to Jamestown and continue. The failure to find gold causes another major problem. The Virginia Company as a joint stock corporation exists to make money, and so far, a group of 100 men on the verge of starvation 3,000 miles away isn't very good for the balance sheet. If the colony won't sustain itself on gold found nearby or taken from the Spanish, it has to nonetheless make money somehow. And it's at this point that a colonist named John Rolfe, a man who would later become governor of Virginia and also, coincidentally, the future husband of Pocahontas, introduces tobacco. Smoking tobacco had been known in Europe for the better part of a century. It had been introduced from America by the Spanish, and pipe smoking was already an exceedingly expensive hobby for Europe's elites. Tobacco can only be planted at certain latitudes and in certain climates, but John Rolf discovers that it can be grown in Virginia. This plant becomes Virginia's salvation. With tobacco plantations, there's now a chance that the colony can actually make money for its settlers and its investors, 
so long as there's also food for everyone else. But there's one major problem. Tobacco planting is an incredibly labor-intensive activity requiring sprawling plantations and a lot of laborers. The colonists need labor from somewhere. Plantation owners begin to import this labor on a massive scale from the British Isles. And to understand why they're able to do this, we should take a brief look at population pressures in 16th and 17th century England. The population of England and Wales was obviously substantially smaller than it would be centuries later, but it had grown over the course of the 16th century at the same time that wages had remained stagnant and in some cases had fallen. Food production also had not risen. This was a time that the cloth industry was expanding across Britain and Europe, and landowners found it much more valuable in England to replace small, arm, small farms owned by rent-paying tenants with large fields grazed by sheep. So there's a significant landless population, one step ahead of starvation, to whom a trip to the New World, even as an indentured servant, would seem attractive. The Virginia Company set the terms of indentured servitude. In exchange for passage across the Atlantic and food and lodging for seven years, and a grant of 100 acres of your own land once you finished, an indentured servant would be indentured to work as a servant for a period of seven years. For those who never dreamt of owning their own land in England, this was a risk worth taking, even if many did not survive Virginia's hot summers long enough to receive their grant. And for masters, this seemed like an ideal system as well. They could import labor that was unlikely to survive the full term, since it was the person who paid for the indentured servant who was responsible for granting the land afterwards. Tobacco farming was backbreaking work. One postscript to this situation, few indentured servants survive in the colony's early years, but by the 1640s, many swamps had been drained and cultivation had moved to the more temperate and healthy interior. More indentured servants survive this full term, and it becomes so unprofitable to masters to sustain them, losing 100 acres each time a worker survives his term, the Virginia's elite turns to another source of labor, African slaves. Now, the transatlantic slave trade is such a wide-ranging and important topic that I'm going to devote an entire lecture to it next week. For now, I'll simply mention that the first slave ship arrived in Virginia in 1619. It was a Dutch vessel that sold a few African slaves on shore. These slaves were sold as indentured servants and were generally, if they survived the full term, granted land. African slavery in Virginia operated much the same as indentured servitude for the first few decades, with the promise, however distant if you did survive, of receiving land and freedom at the end of your term. This would change once indentured servants started surviving in large numbers. By the 1650s and 1660s, slavery in Virginia begins to become a permanent condition into which your children were born.